Welcome to the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Hometown Ticketing is proud to be the exclusive sponsor of the UIAAA Connection Podcast and to provide schools nationwide with the best options for digital ticketing for their events. Visit their website at hometownticketing.com to learn how they can make digital ticketing possible and simple at your school. Thank you to Hometown Ticketing for their exclusive sponsorship of the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the UIAAA Connection. I'm your host, Mark Hutch Hunter. Today, we are incredibly pleased to have as our guest, Jim Watkins, who basically is the chair of the professional development at the NIAAA. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you, Mark. It's uh, great to see you and uh, good afternoon to you. Let's have you begin by sharing with our audience here in Utah and across the nation uh, a few minutes about where you grew up, where you went to college, your first job, that type of a thing. Well, I grew up in the south end of Louisville and uh, where I live was surrounded by distilleries and tobacco warehouses. So every morning I'd wake up, you could smell what they call angel's breath in the air because that's the, the little stuff that comes off of the barrels as it's fermented. And that was about six blocks from Churchill Downs. So to say the least, I knew all about racehorsing. Um, I went to DeSales High School in the South End, played football. I played football in grade school, high school, and college. Uh, got a college scholarship at the University of Dayton uh, back in 1963 and uh, had a great time. I got a good education out of it, and it helped me out along the way. Uh, my first job, uh, I guess my first real job was I uh, was the director of the East Market Boys and Girls Club. And what I did there, kind of like what athletic directors do across the country, you did everything. I was the AD, the director. I was the coach, the bus driver, set up the programs, tutored kids, helped them with their homework and stuff. So you know, it was a good way to get ready for what I wanted to be, and that was to be an athletic director. You went, to, so you played for the Dayton Flyers on scholarship, I assume. Yes, I did. It, it, my dad told me, he said, uh, I don't have enough money to send you to college. If you can get there by playing football, go ahead. But if you don't, I can get you a job working next to me at two turns. And that was a hard job, and I decided playing football and getting an education was the most important aspect. <laughs> okay, so you, <clears throat> how did you get from that first job that you have into, uh, I assume maybe you coached before you got into being an athletic director at a high school? Oh, yeah. I uh, Actually, I had just graduated from university. I came back, got my degree from the University of Louisville, uh, because when I went to college, I did a lot of things, you know, for fun. And uh, so I got a degree from the University of Louisville, but I just happened to go out to my old high school and I asked the athletic director there. I said, hey, are you all looking for an assistant football coach and a teacher? And he said, matter of fact, we are. He said, wait a minute. He went up and called the principal. The principal came down. I had like a five minute interview and they hired me as an assistant football coach, assistant track coach. And I wound up teaching uh, business education at my former high school. And I stayed there for five years. Uh, the first year I was there, I was very fortunate to have a coach a great football team, rated number one in the state of Kentucky. I coached four high school All-Americans on that squad. And I stayed there for five years, became athletic director um, in 1971. And then I left the sales and I wound up going to Valley High School. I got, uh, was asked to coach football at Valley High School. So I left and went to Valley. Coached football for two years. I got invited to the superintendent's office one afternoon and I really thought I was probably gonna get terminated. I like but, the way uh, you say invited to the superintendent's office. And well, it was Mark, because we wound up, I got an invitation and it said uh, that you were invited to the superintendent's office for an afternoon luncheon. So I came home from teaching and coaching and got cleaned up and went to the superintendent's office. And uh, there were four other athletic, four other football coaches in there. The superintendent came in and his name was Richard Van Hoos and everybody just called him 
the man. And uh, he came in and none of the five of us had ever met him at all. We were just coaches around the county. Mm -hmm. He knew everybody. He knew everybody's names, knew where we taught, what we coached. And he looked at us and he said, I just want to let you know you're not in trouble. But the next athletic director or head football coach in Jefferson County Public Fields will come from one of you five guys. And within two weeks, I wound up becoming an athletic director at Southern High School. The other four guys wound up becoming head football coaches and had great careers. In fact, a couple of them wound up becoming athletic directors after a few years. And I was stayed at Southern High School for 15 years as athletic director. And I was uh, president of the Kentucky High School Athletic Directors Association, uh, started their conference. Uh, I helped write the bylaws because when I became an athletic director in, in 1974, uh, the Athletic Directors Association just began. So I kind of got in on the ground level with that. And I stayed at Southern for 15 years. Uh, then I left and I went to the Board of Education for Jefferson County Public Schools. I was a director of athletics, activities, and academic competition for the school district. And, uh, you know, I, I had a great career there and I retired in 2005. So, you know, that's had a, had a great way of getting through there. And I, you know, my, my mom and dad were great people they pushed me to excel my dad always wanted to go to college he never got to his father told him working in a coal mine in northeast ohio was good enough for him so it was good enough for my dad uh, but my dad my dad had bigger sights he wanted me to 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 be more than a coal miner so and i had some when i got in high school my freshman year 1959, all of my coaches and teachers looked like they were having so much fun. I thought, man, that would be a great job. And my head football coach was a tough guy. He was a tough football player. He played at a local high school, played at the University of Louisville, and was eventually got elected. You know, to, he got selected to their Hall of Fame. But he was just a great guy, a great mentor. And even after I came back and started coaching we wound up we stayed close friends all the way up through until his death and I had some great teachers that told me I could do more than what I thought I could and I, you know I really I, I, I was I was blessed to have such uh, loving parents that wanted to push me and move me forward of course it didn't hurt that on my dad's side of the family all my cousins and aunts all wound up becoming teachers and coaches as well. So I, I had something to work with on that, on that thing. So that's kind of where I was, I guess, or where I am now. You mentioned some previous mentors you had, would you like to mention maybe a couple of other ones you had along your way, possibly in the NIAAA once that well, once you got to there? I'll tell you when I, when I was a charter member of the NIAAA when it first started, uh, my first first uh, national conference was in 1975 in St. Louis, Missouri. And I had the good fortune of meeting a fellow that started the athletic director's conventions, Tom Frederick. And Tom Frederick was a great guy. And he saw the need for a National Athletic Directors Association. And he, he started the NIAAA. He, he had a vision along with a lot of other great people within the NIAAA, John Clement was one of them from Wisconsin. Uh, there are so, I mean, there's so many to, to name. Uh, I can't pull all of them out of the hat right now. So Tom saw a need and right after I, we, we hosted the national conference in Louisville in 1978. In 1979, we were in, in uh, Atlanta for the national conference and the NIAAA started a publication committee because in 77, we had the inauguration meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. 78, we had our first elections and everything started moving along. They had a publications committee. John Youngblood, who was president of the NIAAA at the time, came up to me. He was from section two. 
and said, Jim, you're going to be on the publications committee. So he placed me on a publications committee. I stayed there as chairman for 10 years. I met a guy named Jim Teff, who became from Wisconsin. He and I became great friends. He was a mentor to me as well, even though we were we were the same kind of guys, AD. But I learned a lot from him, and I think he learned a lot from me. And then a guy by the name of Frank Kowaleski came along. And Frank had a vision for a lot more success within the NIAAA. Under moving through, Frank was on the professional development committee through the NIAAA that Tom Frederick had set up because Tom saw a need. Frank was very instrumental, along with Nellie Nelson, a man from uh, Wisconsin, in developing and starting the certification program. And what a great thing that was when we started that. We had the first exam in 88 in Las Vegas and everybody that took the exam, I think 105 people took the exam. I think 100 people actually passed. And so you got your notification in, in 1989. So Tom Frederick really saw something in me as a national person to work in things. I was very fortunate. I got to work with the National Federation on a lot of different uh, projects. Uh, we worked with the Sporting Goods Manufacturers of America and did a great survey that we used within AAA for years, which helped move our association forward. So I said, Tom Frederick was great. Frank Kowalewski became more than a mentor. He was a great, close, dear friend. But he saw the potential of the membership of the NIAAA. And that, that's, that's why we are where we are today. And I think things that we have done with the NIAAA, as you're well aware, you were on the board, has trickled all the way down to all the state associations. And look how your state association, I can look and see how our state association has grown because of the input the NIAAA had on each of us and what we took back to our states. So it's been, you know, I've had a great journey so far, that's for sure. Uh, I know, uh, you know, you, one of the things you had listed here as a possible thing. And I, what was your biggest failure? And I kind of alluded to that earlier. My biggest failure that was I didn't really apply myself in undergrad school. I mean, I did enough as the old saying goes to get by. And then when I started to get my master's and my, I got all A's in that. And then when I got my uh, uh, superintendent endorsement, I got all A's in that. And that really projected my career uh, within the school district. Uh, they wanted people that show that they can do a lot of things. That's excellent. Speak for a minute about your journey with the, the Kentucky Athletic Directors Group. And then I wanna come back and ask you a question <clears throat> with the NIAAA. Well, I, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, I wound up on the ground floor with our state athletic director association. When I became an athletic director, like I said, in 74 for the second time, uh, our state association was just started. I got in, the guys came to me, some of the older fellows, and they said, hey, would you help us write our bylaws? So at my high school, we did that. And I worked my way through and, and uh, we set up our officers and I, as I did become president of the association. Uh, we start our convention. Uh, George Koch, who was an AD at one of the public schools here, he and I, he did all the uh, logistics and I did all the speakers. And then he wound up retiring and I took over the entire operation of our convention, which was good. And I pressed some ADs into action and got them to do some things. Uh, and I guess I did our, uh, we, I guess we're at our 45th or 46th. I think I did 40 conventions. Uh, I oversaw 40 conventions. And I had some great people to assist me. I didn't do it by myself. I, I was just the conference director is all they called right. me. And, uh, 
but I had some great people, Phil Risen and Arthur Ballard, who are prominent within the NIAAA, Phil now with, with the state, with the national office. Uh, they came to me one time and said, hey, is there anything we can do to help? We'll be glad to help. And uh, I said, yep. And that, I tease them now. I said, that probably is the biggest mistake you all ever made because I never let them go. You know, I kept, <laughs> kept them there. And uh, then, you know, when we, as the National AD Convention went and with the Publications Committee and things of that nature, it just, it, it kind of was a natural thing for me to move in. And then when we started the leadership training program, uh, when I was a president in 1996, we taught that one class and many people didn't like it. It was eight hours. And uh, so that's when when I was past president, Frank Kowalski said to me, what do you think about if we broke this down uh, into units? And I said, I think it'd be great. And that's where we came up with the four R's and Frank had tabbed Jim Teff to be like the coordinator of the program. My job in the beginning was to help write courses uh, with John Olson. John Olson wrote a course. Uh, Alan Melanda from New York was the first person that taught 501 when we kind of pared it down. I wrote and taught 502. Fred Balsamo, who was past president of the NIAAA, he oversaw 503, which was a citizenship course that the National Federation had developed and we just enhanced it. And then John Olson started the legal. He wrote 504 and was a legal uh, course. And then and these these all came out of the original 501. Yes, they did. Uh, because just, as I as I understand it, and I wasn't there, but the the original 501 would have been in Orlando in right, 96. Nine, correct. Yes, that was and my was year a, that was, I was president. And like I said, it was an eight hour course. Oops, it was an eight hour course, and. Um, <laughs> Everybody complained. You're in Orlando, stuck in a room for eight hours on a Saturday. That wasn't a good thing. And then, but like I said, Frank's vision again came into play. And he, Jim Teff, was on the original group of thirty people that helped set up the uh, five hundred one, what became five hundred one, that program. And we, like I said, and we met, and in July of 97, that's when we decided to break things down and start these four hour courses. We taught them in, in Nashville in 1997, the four courses. And I think every course had 150 people in each course. We maxed out the rooms that we were allotted down there. That was in December. In February of that year, uh, Frank brought myself, Jim Teff, and John Olson back to Kansas City. And we sat down with his leadership and started uh, mapping out what we have today, the 500 courses, 600 courses, and 700 courses. And we started drawing on topics that were in the original 8R501 class. And we just started adding. After about two years, we wound up having what we, what became the state coordinators meeting. We would meet at the national conference for like 30 minutes. Right. And, and at that point we, you know, say, okay, how can we help? And that's what started off to say, well, how can we teach them at the state? And that's when we came up with the idea. A lot of people didn't know about PowerPoint, how to make it work. So we started teaching people to a course that's now 790, which you are the chair of. Right. And you have you've brought that from standing in front of people, showing them a PowerPoint, saying this is how you do it, to becoming interactive with your students now in your class to show people what's the best way to get this point across? And you've done a marvelous job, Mark, in getting a better way of presenting courses. And P 
people now, when they come out of that course, go back to their states, they're better prepared to present. And we now, as you're well aware, we incorporate and all the things that you're doing with that class. We try to get that into our veteran uh, instructors at the national conference. So that's kind of the way all that came about, you know, uh, Fortunately, I was there at the beginning, so I, I, I get to see it, and I've watched it grow. Next year, in 2022, in Opryland, will be the 25th anniversary of what we now have as leadership training. So it, it'll be a, a big, big to-do, hopefully, next year for everybody. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I'm not sure how much I've done with the 790. I know I've done a bit, but <clears throat> obviously it takes me back to when I first met, obviously you and Donnie Bells. Right. And Donnie actually brought me on to the 790. I, I remember Nashville, which is my first conference. And I think that may have been the time that I, and you wouldn't remember this, but it may have been the time when I met you and Jim together. And I think Probably. maybe, I think in 98 is when I coined the phrase Jim squared. <laughs> You're in, right. <laughs> in, uh, in Nevada, because when it was in Las Vegas, I was, uh, I couldn't get enough of it. I took four courses in one national conference. And I think, like you said, there was only six then. Right. And of course I said, after I said to my wife, after I got done, I says, well, I'm not, I'm not taking four again. <laughs> but then I know we I know we started changing the 790 back in 99. And so it's it's gone from there. And I think that's probably when I first became a well, the state coordinator, because I had just taken over as the executive director, so to speak, in Utah, because we hadn't had one. So talk about <clears throat> well, we spoke about this the other day. So I want you to share this with our audience. It's my first conference in Nashville. And I remember going to the opening session. And as I recall, Al Gore was supposed to speak. He couldn't get there. So they got LaDonna Gatlin, right. the sister of the Gatlin brothers, to come. And I remember, well, I'm going to let you tell the story. But I remember when you got called up in Bales and, and Teff. So I share with our audience because I think this is really a, a well, story we're sharing. Uh, the Frank would always have... we. We'd always have a meeting with Frank, Jim and I, to make sure everything logistically was going to work for the national conferences as far as leadership training and other meetings went. So Frank, after me, he said, ask Jim and I, are you all going to go to the opening general session? And we said, well, you know, he said, no, he said, come go. He said, this is really going to be good. He said, you'll really enjoy it. So we we did. We went on down to the to the meeting. We're standing in back and Frank is standing there next to us. And he said, hey, Jim, he said, you need to go up there. All those Wisconsin athletic directors are up there and they've been asking for you. He, and you've been cooped up with me meetings. You would need to go up there. So Jim said, OK. So I told Jim to go ahead and I'd, I'd see him later. So Jim goes up almost to the front of the place and Frank looks at me and he says, hey, you need to go up there and sit behind Jim because I'm going to pull a joke on Jim. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, go ahead. You'll love this. I said, great. So I go up and I sit right behind Jim, the row behind him. Well, as you said, the Gatlin lady comes out and she's a, she's a singer and she's singing. All of a sudden she says, I need some help up here on the stage. And she said, I, I need, I know that we there's I need three people and she said I'd like to have Jim Teff from Wisconsin to come up to the stage to help me out well all the Wisconsin people evidently Frank had tuned <laughs> them in and they're getting all over Jim Jim I'm laughing myself silly and he turns around looks at me and says some words he goes up on the stage and <laughs> He, she goes, and I can hear Frank all the way in the back of this big hall laughing himself <laughs> silly. And she goes, is there a Jim Watkins in the crowd? And I thought, oh, and now the laughter is louder. So I go up on the stage 
And then she calls Don Bales and he, he is just shocked. So he gets up, of course, Frank is just guffawing in the back. Well, she gives Don a little ukulele or something and gives me some, an instrument of some, and she puts this little cowboy hat on Jim Teff's head. And I looked over at him, and of course, these lights are bright up there, and he's sweating bullets. I mean, water's just pouring down him. He's got this little hat up on him, and I looked over to him, and I said, you look just like that little monkey with those sidewalk organ grinders, <laughs> which he did because this hat was so small. Well, to say the least, she wanted us to sing with her and stuff. And the whole time we're up there, Frank is just laughing himself silly because Frank and Jim would always do tricks on each other. Mm -hmm. Jim was getting an award one year in New Orleans and when they brought his lunch out and I was the master of ceremonies, <laughs> they were un pulling the lids off, you know, of your meal and it was chicken. And when they pulled Jim's lid off, it was a rubber chicken under the little thing. <laughs> Frank had put a rubber chicken in there. Well, when Frank Kowalski retired, Jim and I put on a skit at his retirement thing. And all we said when we walked up to him, him and Janelle were sitting up in front and I went by Frank and I said, Frank, it's our turn. And he just looked at me and he said, oh my God. <laughs> and we, we, put on a, we put on a great show that, that for his uh, retirement. I even made a button with Jim, Jim and I's picture on it. And I had it in Boston that said, Frank's kids. Because anytime we would go out to dinner or something and we were there, the waitress always said, well, who gets the check? And I'd always say, give it to our dad. And <laughs> it, Frank, would, Frank would just laugh himself silly over that. So That's, that's a great story. I remember when, when Frank retired. So thank you for sharing that. I want you to explain to our audience here in Utah and nationally, of course, how the Professional Development Committee came to be, because it was, uh, we've talked about the, uh, certification about the LTIs, but now it's the Professional Development Academy and how exactly that come to be. And of course, you're in, in charge of that. Well, to be honest, if we'd have done it the right way, we would have done leadership training first, then we would have done certification and we'd have had all this worked out that way, but we didn't. What used to happen we used to have them, Jim, Teff, and I used to meet with whoever was in charge of the certification committee. We would meet every year at the national conference for about 30 minutes. And we would exchange ideas back and forth. Uh, and it was more, you know, this wasn't anything formal. We just said, okay, what do you think you're all be going to do with, with certification? How can we improve certification and so forth? And then they would say, what, what new courses are you gonna put in and what can we do to work? So we, by a meeting of the minds, we just kind of came together and we started having committee meetings. Jim and I would sit down with several people from the certification committee. Ron Belenko kind of kicked it off and, and Steve Berseth carried it on and Sherry Stice carried it on. And then we decided that because we were so tied at the hip, so to speak, with certification, how to prepare people for certification. Because when we first did the CAA exam, there wasn't anything to study with. So the two leadership training, Jim Teff and myself and John Olson, met with people from certification committee. And we started designing how, how can we help people to learn more so they could pass the CAA exam and that's really kind of the way that started and then as we developed the CMAA we had to figure how how are we going to get people to move forward how is all this going to link together and that's that's the way all this kind of started and it, like I said we should have we did it backwards but it's worked out uh, so now we've got Sherry Stife and Ed Lockwood who are the coordinators for certification and all that they do. And then they work with Don Bales, myself and Scott, 
uh, Dr. Smith to do the other parts, the courses and setting, and we mesh those two things together. And now, you know, we meet uh, three times a year, February, July, and September to plot out what we need to do for the year with our things. A lot of good things have come out of it. We keep adding courses every year. Uh, we've now started the NIAAAU with our uh, programs with the, that uh, Daryl Nance oversees. We've got the QPA now that people can, the Quality Program Award. I mean, the cohort has just shot up. I mean, there are so many things that has come out of this group just by sitting around and talking and listening to the membership. You know, somebody makes, well, how do we get new courses? Comes from state coordinator input, comes from membership input, comes from the board of directors. So, uh, you know, our, our instructors say, you know, we need to take a certain course and it needs to be split because there's so much information and we've done that. You know, 502 now is, is two classes, 502 and 503. And we've done some other ones that way. So it, it's, it, it's just, it keeps growing. And I don't know, it's not gonna stop because there's so much information that our athletic directors around the country need help with. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just been great. I mean, it, this is probably the greatest thing that I, in my opinion, that's ever happened to, to the athletic director profession. Uh, and as you're well aware, we partner with about 20 universities around the country and they use our leadership training courses for master's programs within those universities. Uh, West Kentucky University here in, in Kentucky, down in Bowling Green, they, they have a, probably the best program in the country to get a master's degree in sports administration. And they use a, a majority of our courses to teach these college kids how to be better prepared to become an athletic administrator. So, you know, it, it's just, uh, people such as yourself have brought up ideas and ways to make things better and how we can get more people actively engaged. That's the other positive thing about what we've done with NIAAA. We don't exclude anybody. We invite people, the more the merrier. You know, I work all year long trying to increase our national faculty teaching staffs. As you're well aware, we just finished our state coordinators meeting in September right. for three days that we had a mentoring session to help people, the new ones. We did a tech session to help everybody. It was audience participation. It wouldn't sit and get, uh, you know, you were actively engaged. And we take all this information and we're hoping that all of our state coordinators take this information back to their states and, and make those make them better. And, and that's the biggest thing about the NIAAA. We don't keep secrets. We keep giving information. We keep trying to make everybody better. Um, so, you know, it, it's just uh, what came out of the little seed is now grown into a big tree. And, uh, you know, the Absolutely. professional development, you know, professional development, all the association, the people that have been that have worked their way through that uh, have all left their mark, a footprint on it that other people say, gosh, I wanna, I wanna be just like, I wanna be like a Mark Hunter. I wanna be like a John Olson. I wanna be like a Jim Teff, you know, because they see value in what you're doing. They don't wanna be you, they just wanna be like you. They wanna give, they wanna give back. And that's what you've done as well. Yeah, thank you. I want you to speak now because I don't think the rank and file at the national conference and even in our states, I don't think they quite understand what a huge task it is because I, I've, <laughs> I know because I've tried to talk to you and, and Donnie on occasion in the middle of when courses are going, but you've got probably 12 or 13 courses going on during four different blocks at the conference. I want you just to explain exactly what a huge task that is because I I, I think people just show up at the national conference. Oh yeah, I, I took a couple of classes. It was great. They they just think, well, I just showed up and it was great. But I, give us the behind the scenes because you and I both know that it's a big, big task. Well, it is. Uh, truthfully, 
it, it takes a lot of people to to make it go. But we national conference in December and everything you know set up. The way that it works out in February at our professional development committee. During that, we have a course review going on at the same time, but we'll have our professional development meeting. And at that time, I lay out the schedule for the next conference. So by, by the time I get back to Indianapolis in February, I have the skeleton of how we're gonna set up courses for the next December. And then we kind of plug those in and I go through and make sure we don't have any overlaps make sure that some of our instructors who are actively engaged in, in a, a committee assignment, that we don't have con, you know, conflicts there as well. And we try to make sure that if someone taught on Saturday from uh, 11.30 to 3.30, or if they taught on Monday night uh, from 5.30 to 8.30, you don't get the same spot. We try to rotate things around. Right. Uh, to make it so you're not either first all the time or last all the time. It, it, it gets very difficult. So then what I do at that in February is I start looking through getting uh, people sending me names for new national faculty members. Uh, we get them from the course chairs. We get them from the people that teach at state level on certain courses. And then there's an application process. And then we send that out, we get it back. They have to come up with, they have to tell all the courses they've taken. They have to make sure they've taken 501 and 790. That's the prerequisite. If you wanna teach, you have to have taken the course you wanna teach. So then I work from February all the way around to September, coordinating people and, and uh, making sure that we've got full staffs We've got a lot of retirements going on. So we're looking for additional staff members naturally. And by September, everything's finalized. Uh, and what I will do from now till the November is I'll start notifying the course chairs if we've got any new people for their staffs. I give them their contact information so they can get together and determine what part they're gonna teach in a course. I will send out all of the chair persons of each course here's your teaching staff here's the here's the day you're going to teach here's the room you're going to be in at the conference uh you you know you do you need an lcd do you need a laptop do you need uh notepads do you need charts uh, those kind of, all these different things that go in as you said when people walk in it's there right. ready to go make sure that when our instructors show up, they have everything they need to teach the class. Now we have course, excuse me, facilitators that James Perkins oversees and they will sign the people in, scan them in, they scan them out. They make sure all the, we get the books out to them, make sure that all the materials are there for them. Uh, and we set that up. And then I work, I do work with Patty Conrad in the national office in Indianapolis to make sure that we've got proper rooms. And you're right, we'll have 13 or 14 classes going on for four sessions. Now, this year, we will not offer any classes on Friday night because we're going to have a award ceremony for the people that didn't have the awards last year during when COVID, when we did everything online. And, but in Nashville next year, because we keep adding courses, we will we will teach classes on Friday night in Nashville in 2022. Most likely four classes on Friday night and 14 for four sessions the rest of the time to make sure that we get all of our courses. So it takes, takes a year to get everything ready to go. Uh, the other thing that I do is I work with the printing company. Uh, one of my jobs is to review periodically every leadership training course we have. And this past year and a half, we've done everything via Zoom, as you're well aware, because you took part right. in that. Uh, in that process, we have a about a 90 minute orientation process. We try to make it as close to the real 
face to face as we can. And then 90 minutes, we talk about how what the process is and how you're going to get to it, and uh, what what we need to do. And then it works out that uh, then we come back. And we have two more meetings that are about three hours where they we collaborate back and forth, find out what has been done in the last 30 days, and then. I'm working right now to get all the updated PowerPoints, updated manuals to the printer. I have to take them from the instructors. I turn them into a print mode that the company wants. And I met with them yesterday to outline everything we're going to do. And then they will get all that together. I give them their, when they have to have everything finished, when it has to be boxed up, they color code everything by day, by session. So we know that red goes on Saturday morning and green goes this time and so forth. Then they ship it to Indianapolis. It goes into a uh, semi and they'll take it off to Denver or wherever we're going. So it, and I, like I said, I, I don't do it by myself. Got a lot of great help. Don Bell's been a lifesaver when Jim Teff passed away. I was by myself and he made the wrong turn. He came in and said, hey, you need some help? And I said, yep. And uh, he's stuck, so he's got to stay <laughs> with me right now. So that's the way it is. So well, thank you for sharing that because I I just wanted to make sure that everyone out there in the athletic direct world realizes that particularly at the national conference, it is a huge huge task to put on. So I want to draw on your fifty some odd years as being an athletic director and tell me right now. I'm sure if I asked you 30 years ago, the favorite part of your job would have been the students because you were in a school. But now that right. you've in the twilight of your career, so to speak, what is the favorite part of your job now? Uh, dealing with people across the country, well, globally now, because we have international courses and just trying to help people, you know, mentor some new folks that are coming in, helping the people that we've got. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I think you've got to give people assistance and, but you can't tell them, well, this is the way I did it. Therefore, this is the way you should do it. Everybody's got to make, you know, everybody comes up with their own leadership style. And I, I, I just want to help people. The, the best part of my job is when somebody comes up at the national conference and says, man, that was the best class I've ever taken. Those instructors were fantastic. I feel good because I had a small part in identifying a leader. I, I may not be the smartest person, but one thing I can do, I know when I spot a leader and I can tell. And that's why I pulled in people such as yourself, the, the Don Bales, the Arthur Ballards, the Phil Risens of the world to help me do things because they were leaders. People respected them. And as the old saying goes, you all weren't afraid to get your hands dirty. And that, that's the mark of a good leader, being able to look out and see what are the needs? What do I need to do right now to make this person a little bit better? How can I help them? So hopefully I've done that. Hopefully, I, you know, when it's my time comes and it's gone, people say, well, you know, Jim did a pretty good job. That's all, I, that's all you can ask for. You did better than a pretty good job. I can speak <laughs> from, from my experience. Let's wrap it up with a couple of questions. The first being, if you could share with a new athletic administrator, I consider a new one between one and four years, you could give them two suggestions that they would absolutely have to have in order for them to begin to be successful as an AD, what would those two things be? Number one, talk to your principal every day. First thing in the morning. I met with my principal every morning at seven o'clock. I got my office at 6.30, met with him at seven, and he and I would meet from seven to 7.30 because we oversaw the buses coming in. He knew exactly what was going on. I kept him abreast of everything. and it made a great, we had a great bond. And that was the most, because I, other ADs would say, God, my principal this. And I said, do you talk to him? Well, 
I, I never kept any secrets from my principal. I told him exactly what was going on with the staff, the, you know, the faculty, students, coaching, you know, and I promised him. The other thing you should do, promise your media supervisor, you're not going to have any surprises. They're not going <laughs> to read in the paper where one of your coaches screwed up or you screwed up or whatever. No surprises. Keep your people informed, your coaching staff. It's imperative. Have a beginning of the school year staff meeting with all your coaches and just talk about what you want to accomplish globally with the athletic department, not winning football games or basketball games, but what you want to accomplish that year. And then meet seasonally as you would break it down. Then go back and say, okay, here's what we got to do in the fall, the winter, and the spring. And when you do a budget, let everybody know what's going on. You know, budgets aren't supposed to be secret. <laughs> and when you tell people, <clears throat> we're giving you 10% because they're, they're less likely to complain. They're going to see why you give them a 10% raise in their, their, what they what want, they want. So, you know, I just think if you're honest with your staff, communicate with your principal, you're going to have a, a smooth sailing and listen to, you know, listen to the other athletic directors, you know, in your area. Uh, come to a national conference. Go to your state conference and listen to what people are saying. Now, I heard a lot of things in all my years of going to things. And I've tried things at my school when I was an AD. Some of it worked and some of it didn't. But you don't know until you try. And uh, one thing I found, I learned from a guy, Joe Tonelli in Connecticut. We were talking about kids getting cut off teams. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, we have a, a tryout day, one tryout, extra tryout day. And I said, what's that? What it was, kid got cut, parent got upset. He let him come out and try out one extra day. He's, you know, so I tried that. And I'm, my father called me one time. His kid got cut from the baseball team. He said, my kid's the best pitcher. He was all American Little League. This. So I said, okay. I said, you come over tomorrow. What time can you be here? He said, four o'clock. So you come over tomorrow. You bring your son, and he'll get an extra try. I told my baseball coach, my baseball coach went ballistic. <laughs> I said, look, if he thinks he can play third base, then you put your best batter up and hit the, hit balls to him. If he he's the best pitcher, put your best batters in there. I said, but give the kid, maybe the kid had a bad day. I only did that once or twice. I think one kid got put back on the team because he really did have a bad tryout. The other time, the father came up to me afterwards. He said, Mr. Watkins, thank you. My son is not as good as those other guys. He needs to work. And the other thing mm -hmm. I would tell people, when you cut somebody, and I'm my basketball coaches, this is what you had. If you cut somebody from the basketball team, you didn't put a list up and say, Johnny, you didn't make it. You called every kid in that didn't make the basketball team, and you tell them why. Well, you can't dribble with your left hand. You can't shoot a leg. Tell them what they could work on to get better. Now, what that does, it makes the kid feel good, and it gives the kid some hope. You know, it's the worst thing in the world to do is to stand with your friends and say your name's not on the list. Mm -hmm. But when you get called in, you know, it helps out. So, you know, I, I hope I've given some – insight into what goes on like i said i've had a marvelous career i've met some outstanding people and i've been blessed i wouldn't trade anything in the world for what i've been able to do so thank you very much mark <laughs> what question should i have asked you that i failed to ask you nothing i i probably have talked way too long <laughs> uh about it you know i i think to be an athlete, don't become an athletic director because you think that's going to be a step to become an assistant principal or a counselor or something else. Become an athletic director because you want to help a lot of people. And because that's what athletic directors do. And the athletic director in a school is seen by more people in a day than any administrator in the school district. And just realize you touch a lot of lives 
So keep up the good work and don't get down. And if you made it through COVID, you can make it through anything. Very well said. That wraps it up for another edition of the UI AAA Connection. Once again, our guest has been Jim Watkins, CMAA and head of the Professional Development Committee. Thanks, Jim, for being on the show. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And have a wonderful evening. For our listeners, we hope you tune in again next week for another edition of the UI AAA Connection.